Welcome to High Impact Living, the motivational speaking of Rick McDaniel, the noted author, international communicator, and senior pastor at Richmond Community Church in Richmond, Virginia. This is uh, an important message. Relationships are so vital, and there's viruses that get into our relationships, and they make them unhealthy, they make them sick, and they need to be healthy, and they need to be well, and that's what we're going to attempt to do today, is to bring healing into relationships, family relationship, marital relationships, friend relationships, work relationships, wherever they might be. So take out your information guides, if you would, this purple note sheet, and welcome all of you on our internet campus. It's great to have you with us in ever-increasing numbers, the High Impact Living broadcast, and certainly those of you here at the Glen Allen campus, Richmond, Virginia, where I'm speaking from today, the Gospel of John, chapter 13, Verses 34 and 35, these are the words of Jesus. But I'm giving you a new command. You must love each other just as I have loved you. If you love each other, everyone will know that you are my disciples. And now the definition of love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. Love is kind and patient, never jealous, boastful, proud, or rude. Love isn't selfish or quick-tempered. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs that others do. Love rejoices in the truth, but not in evil. Love is always supportive, loyal, hopeful, and trusting. Love never fails. You know, those of you who heard me speak know that uh, I'm a researcher by training and education. I always love research. I believe facts are our friends, and some new research has come out in uh, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a study done at some university in North Carolina that just lost the national championship game. And, um, oh, that felt good. All right, so here's, here's what the research says. The depth and the breadth of your social ties impact your health just like diet and exercise. The depth and the breadth of your social relationships impact your health just as much as diet and exercise. Adolescents who are socially isolated face the same risk for developing inflammation as those who don't exercise. Older adults are more at risk for developing hypertension from social isolation than from diabetes. Higher social strain increases the odds of abdominal obesity and inflammation during early to mid-adulthood and carries even higher risk of overall obesity as people get older. This is what the research shows. Now you say, how did they come to such conclusions? Pastor Rick, well, they identified the social ties, what they would call social integration, and here's what they looked at. Numbers of friends, marital status, religious affiliation, and involvement in community domains, involvement in various community organizations. That's what they looked at in terms of the social ties. In terms of the social support, they measured through questions asking people about the following things, whether their friends or relatives were critical, supportive, loving, argumentative, and annoying. So looking at certain aspects of the depth of a social relationship, looking at the various ways in which people could come together socially, this is what they discovered, that the impact on your health Not emotional health now. That's a given. We're talking about your physical health is impacted by your relationships just as much as the way you eat and whether or not you exercise. So when we talk about building bridges and we're talking about building better relationships, the impact is not just social or emotional, it is also physical. Relationships are enormously important. They impact us in so many ways. And yet, 
they can be a source of a lot of pain and a lot of upset. And why is that? Well, when you blend together people of different backgrounds and of different temperaments and of different personalities and of different genders and of different ages, voila, you have the recipe for potential conflict. Potential. Doesn't have to be that way. When I work with couples, helping them to get ready to be married, the, the whole goal of the pre-marriage process is to try to help them understand that though they are different in all these ways, at the same time, they can still have a successful marriage. Relational problems develop because of these kinds of issues and, and because of other issues which the Bible would call sinful behavior. <laughs> sinful behaviors. Behaviors that are not God-honoring and God-glorifying and that God has said these are not good for you. And by the way, you know, every time I find myself on television and in the newspaper and people are attacking me, I get this sort of uh, line that goes something like this as it happened again this week. You know, sort of in one way or another, uh, who are you to tell us what to do or why are you saying that these things exist? And I just want to say this uh, incredibly uh, brilliant statement today. Christianity is about moral behavior. Surprise! That's what it means to be a Christian. It means to follow the teachings of the Bible the teachings of Jesus Christ. And there is a moral component to that. And I don't know why that is so hard to understand or see. I don't really think it is, by the way. I don't think it's intellectually difficult to comprehend. I think it's just volitionally, by your own will, you simply don't want to do it. But let's not talk about it as if it isn't true. The sinful behaviors... And our own issues of background and personality and gender, you throw those all in a mix together, and you've got yourself potential for some viruses, for some sicknesses to affect our relationships. But we can be cured of those things. So let's look at some of those viruses today. The fault-finding virus. C.S. Lewis once wrote this piece called The Trouble with X. And it's all about basically X meaning other people. The trouble with other people, if we could just get these other people straightened out, you know, that their faults and their issues, if we could just get them straight, you know, the, the world would be great. And this is the challenge, and I, and I put this first because I think it is a fundamental challenge of relationships, which is to shift immediately to other people and say, now here's what's wrong with you. Let me point out your faults and your deficiencies. And if you'll just get those straight, our relationship will be fine. It's an enormous temptation to just immediately go, you know, this is where you're coming up short. And by the way, it is amazing how quickly we are able to find fault and how it seems harder for us to point out the good things. Very weak amen which is a lot of guilty people. It's true. And yet studies tell us we need five positives for every one negative. And yet our internal wiring probably is the reverse of that. We probably point out five faults for every one positive. Fault finding. At its very core, this is essentially a, a, a drive to change a person to change them, to make them something they're not, which is why, again, just talking about pre-marriage, working with couples in pre-marriage counseling, and I don't do a lot of that anymore, or a lot of counseling in general, but I will tell you that I still have a commitment, especially to our younger couples, to find time to, to do this kind of work because I think it's so important to set them up for success, and here's what I already say to them. The person you're looking at right now is the person you got. Do not think this. Well, once we get married, I'll change him. I'll, you know, I'll smooth a few of his rough edges off and we'll get him wearing cologne and using moisturizer and all that stuff. Don't think that way. <laughs> oh, man.
Yeah, and somebody asked me that yesterday. That's why it's fresh in my mind. So, uh, are you using moisturizer? Um, can I just get my shirt altered and let me be on my way? I'll be a happy guy. Don't think that way. Don't think that way. Don't think in terms of how can I change a person, but this is the person. This is who the person is. Here's another part of this fault-finding virus, really, really unhealthy stuff, which is this. Talking about past mistakes. Going back and saying, you did this. And two years ago when you said that, and six months ago when you forgot this, I can tell you, friends, that will never help a relationship. Most people, most, are fairly well aware of their mess-ups and their mistakes, and they feel bad about it, and they don't need to be pounded and pounded about it because they already know they messed up. And certainly, if someone has owned it and apologized for it, there's just no place for that. We need to be able to say, instead of rubbing it in, I'll rub it out. Instead of rubbing it in, which is what happens in fault-finding virus, I'll rub it out. I'll, it'll be gone. It'll be erased. I'm not going to rub it in anymore. I'm going to erase it and rub it out. That's what God wants to see from us. That's the kind of relational dynamic that will lead us to healthy and building better relationships. And this, this fault-finding virus won't be a, a part of our lives. We can get rid of it. Now, there's an antidote for every single one of these viruses today, and the antidote is found in the definition of love. So here's the antidote for fault-finding. Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Love, here it is, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs that others do. The antidote, don't keep a record of wrongs. Don't be in a marriage. Don't be in a family. Don't be in a friendship. Don't be in a work relationship in which you are going to keep records of wrongs, where you are going to constantly bring up the faults of other people. It doesn't end up well. You can't have a healthy relationship and you can't build better relationships if the fault-finding virus is a part of it. Here's another virus, the insecurity virus. This is where we constantly or consistently threaten to break off the relationship. Things are going well, things take a turn, and then the threats are made. You know, I'm not going to be your friend anymore. I'm going to divorce you. These kinds of words never help a relationship. I've encouraged couples for years, and I'll just say it again. Saying the word divorce is never going to turn out to be a smart thing to do. Bringing that word into the conversation does nothing positive. It does a lot of negative things. It doesn't do anything positive. You say, oh no, Pastor Rick, you're wrong. I have to threaten in order to get attention. I have to threaten in order to make my point. There are ways of getting attention and making your point without using that word. Just take it from a guy whose life is devoted to spoken and written words. There are a lot of words in the English language that one can find to get attention and to make a point without getting into words that simply do not bring about a positive result. They create insecurity, not security. Another aspect of this whole insecurity virus is a lack of authenticity and a lack of full disclosure. What brings an insecurity virus into a relationship is when there is a phoniness, when, when there is a hiddenness, when we keep certain things from another person. And when we keep that from them, it, it gets found out at some point. When our lack of authenticity is revealed, it, what it brings about then is an insecurity in the relationship. 
And that insecurity is not a healthy or good thing. In fact, it generally leads to another very negative dynamic called jealousy. Jealousy then becomes the dominant characteristic of the relationship. I'm not secure in our relationship, our friendship, our marriage, and so I now am jealous of all of these various things that I see happening. I'm all, there's, there's, the trust issue is, and trust is foundational to relationships, the trust issue is now shaky. And so now the, the dynamic is, uh, are you really being truthful with me? Is that really what happened? Are you telling me only part of the story or the whole story? These kinds of actions don't lead to building better relationships. Security comes from being honest. Now, honesty can be hard. And let's just be frank today, as if we haven't already been. Some simply don't want that kind of confrontation. They don't want, they don't want that. They're, they're, they're unwilling. Or they say to themselves something like this. If I do that, the person's going to look at me and say something like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. Or it's going to go like this. Okay, okay, yeah, you're right. And it agree, but then never change the behavior, never change the situation. It just keeps going the way it's always been going. But I, you know, the other person said, well, yeah, yeah, you got a point there. That's good. But nothing, nothing ends up happening that's, that's different. Or, of course, it can just be a, a flat-out disagreement. Uh, I don't agree with that at all. I don't think that's the case. And like in marriage, for instance, where some people believe that conflict is a bad thing, I'm not one of those people. I don't believe that conflict is a bad thing. I think conflict can actually be healthy. It all depends on how you fight. You can fight fair or you can fight ugly. You fight ugly, it's not a good thing. You fight fair, it, it, can, it can lead to a better relationship. There's just no way two people are always going to agree. There's no way two people are always going to get along. People are going to hurt each other. They're going to offend each other even if they don't mean to. So there's going to have to be times of discussion confrontation call it what you want in which it's got to be laid out on the table there and you've got to just say hey this is you know this is how i feel and if you can do that in honesty it's a good thing another part of the insecurity virus has to do with commitment do you keep your commitments if you say you're going to do something do you do it have you ever had a friend who says they're going to do things and then doesn't do what they say because I have. It's frustrating. And, and what I've learned about most of these friends that I've had that are this way is, is that they want to, but instead of saying, I can't do that, just tell me I can't make it. I, I won't be able to be there. That's fine. It's okay. I can hear the word. They say yes, but they, they can't fulfill that commitment. And then that just leads to insecurity in the relationship. It's simply better to just say, and I, I, I can't, I can't commit to that. I can't be there rather than to commit and then break the commitment and not follow through. For some of you that have sort of that people-pleasing dynamic going on, these are hard things to hear because, you know, you want everyone to be happy, you want everyone to get along, you want everyone to like you, and I just want to tell you that's not the real world. Now, I'm married to one of those people who happens to not be here today, conveniently. But, uh, and no one will quote anything that I say here today. So I understand it. I mean, I get it. I understand, and believe me, the heart, I think, is, is a good heart, and it's in the right place. But in the end, this is not the way reality functions. And so you have to be able to just say sometimes, yeah, I, I just can't make it, even if that's a temporary disappointment. Because what brings insecurity virus into a relationship is when you keep breaking commitments and then people don't know if they can count on you or trust you. What's the antidote, by the way? Well, here's what, again, love is never jealous. Love is loyal, hopeful, trusting. There it is. 
you want to heal the virus of insecurity in your relationships, love isn't jealous, love is loyal, love is hopeful, love is trusting. You let those dynamics exist and the insecurity will go away. Third virus, the antagonizing virus. This is where we purposely push people's buttons. Or people purposely push our buttons. You're just like your mother. What did you just say? And boom, off we go. When we purposely say and do things that will not result in anything positive. As I have said, I believe conflict is a natural dynamic that exists in relationships. You don't need to encourage it. You don't need to enhance it. It will happen by itself. A kind of antagonizing virus just ends up tearing friendships apart, tearing marriages apart, tearing families apart. Sometimes in parental child-parental relationships, these kinds of things begin to happen. Where you end up having a situation where the children are antagonizing the parents, and then the parents decide that they've had enough of it and start antagonizing the children, and you just have a household that is in conflict and disarray. Love has just left the building the house is not a home. It is a house where people reside. One of these antagonizing ways is the silent treatment. And I just want to tell you, friends, the silent treatment, it, some people, some psychologists uh, use a strong word like abuse and say silence is abuse. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a hard, that's a tough word. I, I reserve that, maybe, maybe, but it's, it's not a healthy thing. And here's, here's what you have to ask yourself. If you're going to give people the silent treatment, then here's what you need to ask yourself. Who is going to be honest with you when you punish people for being honest with you? Well, I don't want people to be honest with me, Pastor Rick. <laughs> yeah, and how's that working? Relationships that aren't built on honesty have no hope of being better. You can't build relationships with people that can't speak the truth to each other. Now again, the Bible says speak the truth in love, so I'm not talking about, as I've already said, antagonizing people by just lashing out at them. But just going silent doesn't achieve anything. The goal is to work on harmony, on unity. Unity is a very, very powerful principle in terms of what the Bible has to say. And it's worth noting that when in John 17, when Jesus prays what's called the high priestly prayer, he says these words. He says, Father, I pray that they, my followers, would be one like you and I are one. The way that the Godhead functions in this marvelous trinity in which the three are one, and there's perfect unity. Unity is not uniformity, and you would see this even in the trinity. It's not doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the Father are all different, yet they're the same. Hard to understand, but easier for us to understand on, say, a relational level. It's, God never said we all have to be the same, but he wants us to be in unity. Unity is ultimately diverse people that share a common vision, a, a common goal, a common value. And God wants that for us. You can disagree with people without being disagreeable. Amen? You can disagree without being disagreeable. Now you say, Pastor Rick, um, that sounds like a tall order. I'm not saying it's easy, but it can be done. I went over to Cabela's to open the new outdoor store, Cabela's, and I went over there yesterday since I didn't have my wife around. I could do guy stuff, so I walked in there, and uh, 
first thing that struck me was I need to be fishing more. I need to stop working so hard for this church and start fishing more. But after that thought uh, left me, uh, you know, I just, it's, there was a ton of people there. I mean, a massive number of people. And you just walk around and you just think, wow, there's so many diverse people in this world. I've never seen so many women wearing camo in my entire life. My entire life. I've never seen it. I mean, wow. Now, you just go down the road to Short Pump Mall, and you'll see the women dressed there. Yeah, I don't think you're going to see much camo. It's uh, walk into Nordstrom's and see how the camo goes over there. I mean, wow. And that's just, that's people. We're different. So you want to sit up there with your boyfriend in a tree stand and shoot deer? Okay, great. And someone else says, I don't even want to be near a gun. <laughs> you know what? It's okay. It's fine. People are different. So we're different, but God wants us to be in unity. He doesn't, we don't have to sacrifice our uniquenesses, but God wants us to be in unity. And when we choose to be in relationship, when we choose that, we choose it for a reason. And God wants us to be able to, even when we disagree, not be disagreeable in how we do it. What's the antidote from the Bible? Well, here's what the Bible says. Love isn't selfish or quick-tempered. Love isn't selfish or quick-tempered. You know what antagonizes selfish behavior? You know what antagonizes a quick temper? Just working on those two will go a long, 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 long ways. Here's another virus, the neglect virus. I think this is such a common virus, it almost goes unnoticed. In our busy lives, we don't give enough time to relationships. It's part of, part of why we're doing this series. Part of why we built a giant bridge up here, to just give you this visual picture that this is what God wants us to be doing, building bridges. Are you building bridges? Are you a bridge builder? Neglect virus is about not even caring about that being so wrapped up in whatever we're doing that we, we, we don't invest in friendships the way we should. We don't invest in our family, in our marriage. This is why I'm so excited about tonight and doing the five love languages for you folks here at the Glen Allen campus. And I hope you plan on coming because when you learn because some of you are like, I just don't even know what to do. When you learn the love languages, then you have a choice to make. Will you choose to invest time and effort in showing love? In the language in which that person can receive it and, and understand it and appreciate it and ultimately feel loved? Or do you just go on sort of neglecting it? Now, it's one thing to be ignorant. It's another thing to be willful and just simply choose not to do it. Relationships take effort, they take work. And again, to go back to the pre-marriage, I always say to this to couples, even on their wedding day, marriage is a lot of hard work, because it is. If you neglect a relationship, it's not going to go well. It's so funny, because my wife went to our nephew's uh, wedding this weekend and she's been gone and all you have to do if you've been married a long time like me is just be like your wife is gone and then you realize what you're missing like wow this 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 not there and hopefully you know, you can have that kind of experience, you know, where like your wife will actually come back. Instead of having to have another deeper, more painful experience to kind of wake up to, man, I've just kind of been in my own world here and I've just been neglecting this marriage and no wonder my husband is not happy. No wonder my wife is not happy. And the same thing goes for friendship. You can't neglect friends and then wonder why you no longer hang out and why you no longer talk. 
We have to be intentional. There has to be an intentionality in which we schedule. I, I believe in this. I mean, this is certainly my bent, but I believe in scheduling. I believe that that's how, that's how it, for a guy like me, that's how it happens. And I don't think I'm the only one like this, by the way. I sit down every Friday at lunch. I get my calendar out with my wife every Friday, and I say, okay, here's what I'm doing, here's where I'm going, here's my commitments, and so then what are we going to do, and what do you want to do, and how are we going to make all this happen? You have to do stuff like this. I have buddies of mine that live in other parts of the country, and six months in advance will plan to get together somewhere at some place, six months in advance in order to keep the friendship. It's one thing to talk on the phone and text, and that's all, you know, that's all good and well, but you know, there's a time for face-to-face. -face. And it's simply, if you just neglect to do it, there's another part of neglect, and that has to do with the, the minimizing or even ignoring other people's feelings, just, you know, oh, you know, minimizing, eh, you know, it's not that big a deal, and, or completely ignoring altogether. That kind of neglect, and let me just tell you how that works. You, you do that enough, and people will stop telling you. They'll stop telling you. And here's the problem. Some of us are like, everything's fine. This is why this dynamic happens where somebody comes back from, a husband or wife comes back from a business trip. It's usually a husband, not, you know, just not trying to be picking on anyone, but generally speaking, statistically, it's usually the husband who comes back from a business trip and like the house is like half empty. Or walks into the bedroom and the closet is half empty. And, uh, hey, Pastor Rick, um, I need to talk to you, okay? Because I came home and like my wife's gone and I thought everything was fine. Everything wasn't fine, but at some point, stop, just stop telling you because you ignore it and you don't listen to it, and then this is what happens. And this isn't what God wants to happen, by the way. Let's go back to the words of Jesus. I'm giving you a new command. You must love each other just as I loved you. And if you love each other, everyone will know you're my, you're my followers. If you're a follower of Christ today, it's, it's a relational dynamic that you're involved in. You have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. God wants you to have relationships with other people. God wants you to show love to other people. The antidote, by the way, for neglect is love is always supportive. Love is never boastful, proud, or rude. That's what God wants. He wants those kinds of qualities to be a part of our relationships. He's got an antidote for these viruses. They don't have to be in your life. They don't have to be in your relationships. It does take effort. It does take work. And I would simply challenge you with this question today. And what else would you want to do with your time? How else would you want to invest your energy, what is more important than your relationships. As has been said so many times by so many different people, when they reach the pinnacle of whatever their professional goals are, or they get wherever it is they want to be materially with owning this and having that, they turn around and the thing that they always say is, you know, I want to be able to share this with someone. Time and time again, you hear people say, I'm resigning from this lofty position, this incredible job, because I want to spend more time with my family. At the end of the day, the relationships we have with people is what makes life rich and worthwhile. Amen? Then you have to deal with these viruses and build better relationships. Pastor Rick will return in just a moment with some closing words of encouragement. Before he does, I wanted to remind you about our webpage, www.highimpactliving.com. It's your resource for a high-impact life. So let's pray together. Will you bow your heads with me for just a moment? Would you just close your eyes just, just to focus today? You know, it's one thing to hear a message like this and say, yeah, I got to do that. 
you know, and then it's another thing to just sort of hear the message and then leave and then never, never make a, make a, a change, never do anything differently. Some of you are on some shaky ground today, if we were to be honest. You're, you're on shaky ground and, it, you know, these viruses, like, it's bad. And you got to do something quick. Good news is there's an antidote. But time is of the essence. It's a wake-up call. Lord, I just pray for each person listening to my voice, however they might be watching or listening today. They know. They know there's some of these viruses in their relationships and they need to do something and they need to do it now, not later, but now. And I just pray that you will help them. Anyone who wants to show love in a better way, anyone who wants to build a strong relationship is someone who will find full support and help from you. That is a prayer that you will answer every single time. Any person who would reach out to you today and say, Lord, I just really need your help because I just need to be more and fill in the blank of whatever it is. I know, God, you'd answer that prayer and you'd help them and I pray they would reach out to you today right now. I'm hoping that out of a of a message like this, relationships might be spared, might be saved, and might be strengthened. That's my prayer, and I pray that you help people to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.